Anders and Louise. Um, so Anders and Louise, um, a design development duo from Navoda. Um, they're going to be um, talking about collaborative efforts um, that they, they they've been they've been working on um, in terms of implementing motion from um, from from design over to development. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Anders. Hey, Brian. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. There we are, all working well? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, oh, good. Right. Um, so I should uh, I should start with a with a warning to say that there's going to be a lot of Judge Judy gifts in this uh, presentation. Um, simply because I've been watching a lot of a lot of her on YouTube and she is just total queen. Um, <laughs> but I came up with this uh, this title for the talk, a motion to collaborate, because I thought it sounded a little bit like uh, a motion to dismiss, which keeps being referenced because it's this legal action um but it was just too good of an opportunity because there's so many amazing reaction gifts from her um like darren mentioned um so i'm i'm anders i'm a digital product designer and with me i got louise who's one of the fantastic engineers i work with at Navoda, which is a digital product agency in london um so me and louise have both been working for a while now on the android channel 4 app and uh, one of the ambitions we had for this year has been to add more motion into the app to try to make it more of a cohesive experience rather than just a set of static views. Um, and on this journey, we started talking about different ways that we can collaborate better and bridge the gap between design and engineering. So we wanted to share some of our experiences so far in four ways. Um, firstly, looking at the different ways that designers typically hand over motion to understand the pros and cons of each process. Uh, and secondly, looking at how an engineer creates motion for interfaces to understand the kind of mechanisms and logic behind the scenes. Um, third, we wanted to talk about some of the details of the variables that you need to define when delivering motion. And lastly, we want to touch on how Protopy specifically can help bridge the gap between design and engineering. So moving into the first section, um, there are many different ways that you can communicate your motion design to your engineer and whatever approach that you choose will dip depend kind of on the context. So for example, the complexity of the interaction, uh, even the relationship that you have with the engineer, uh, your ways of working, how much time you have and so on. Um, so to go through kind of some of the examples that I've tried that in the past. So a lot of you have probably seen some sort of variation of this document. Um, it's probably the closest thing that we have to a best practice standard. So the idea is that you create this timeline and you map all your interactions against it, listing all the relevant uh, variables and kind of break things down into a very digestible format. But you also get a big uh, a sense of the big picture and the kind of choreography. So things like um, which items come in together, which ones are delayed. Um, and it's also a great way of doing things if, like I said, if you're, if you're delivering a very complex piece of motion. Um, the good thing is it also gives you a common understanding to kind of discuss and tweak elements as you work through through it and work together because you can kind of reference back to the spec and you can use the same kind of terminology. Um, the only downside with it really is that it just takes a lot of time and effort to put together um, and it's not always going to be worth that effort or you might not have the resources to do it every single time. So a more kind of lightweight approach, uh, which I quite often do, is what I'm just calling a style sheet. So for less complex motion, or if you have a really good understanding of how your engineer is going to implement it, then in most cases, just providing the kind of variables is enough. And it's really quick and easy, but it doesn't really work well if the if the motion is more complex with several elements. Because unlike the, the motion spec, this doesn't really give you that overview of, of, the, of the choreography of, of which elements come in together and so on. So you kind of need to read through all of it and get an understanding of how everything works before you can crack on with it. Um, the upside, of course, is that it's really easy to deliver. So you could do it just like a, a PDF like I've, I've got here, or you could put it into just an email or even a Jira story. Um, sometimes I've even actually just put it inside of my proto prototypes and just sent that as a single deliverable. Um, 
from my previous experiences, um, just providing a video reference seems to be quite a common one as the only deliverable, which I find is a little bit strange because it doesn't really communicate that much. Um, I'm wondering if it might stem from the, the fact that some designers are kind of just a little bit un unsure about how to do it and they don't want to kind of deliver something that's wrong. Uh, so this is kind of just the easiest way. Um, I think this is a crucial deliverable um, kind of alongside something else. So for example, next to a style sheet, um, because the, the video kind of gives you an overview of the general idea and the feel of the motion. It also lets you scrub through it frame by frame so you can really understand what's going on, and kind of get the little minute details that might be hard to describe just with words. And of course, it gives you something to compare the build to so that you can make sure once you have the finished build, you can make sure that nothing's gotten lost in translation. And if you're already prototyping, then a video output is just going to be a natural output of that. Um, but like I said, it doesn't provide enough detail to implement the motion accurately because you can't look at a video and translate that into an easing curve. That's, there's just no way to do that. And even to get timing, you technically could do that, but it's just so much back and forth scrubbing and counting the frames. It's, it's ridiculously time consuming. So when in doubt, you can always go with the true and tested, just kind of waving your hands around and making sound effects. Um, that's uh, certainly kind of the, the first one I tried out. Um, doesn't always go that well. <laughs> so moving on, um, one that I quite like um, for very specific kind of types of animations, so something like a, a loading spinner or an animated icon. You can just build it yourself. So you got popular tools like Lottie, but even simpler ones as well, like uh, this online tool called Shapeshifter. It lets you kind of build your animation with a simple timeline, and then you can export it as an animated SVG or even a vector drawables specifically for Android. Mm -hmm. So over to Lewis. Great. So um, I wanted to have a very focused conversation um, when it came to um, just discussing motion and how the handover should you know, best be carried out. So I decided to create a very simplistic app to focus my thoughts on what it was needed uh, for this. And um, I was thinking about mainly how to implement motion. And I was thinking, OK, in order to implement this stuff, how do I look at it from a de development perspective? And the, I came up with these very crucial questions that I found myself asking I was asking myself over and over when implementing motion. And one of the very first things I kept asking myself was, what are the elements involved in emotions? And when I mean by elements, I mean um, text views or images. And what exactly am I moving around or trying to move around in, on the screen? Second question was, um, how, how, how do I classify this, this motion? Is it a single screen motion? Does, do all the elements animate within a single um, screen of the app? Or is it coming from one screen over to the next? And obviously, that means that the actual bulk of the animation is going to happen on the destination screen. So if you're going from a list to a details view, all the, the animation is actually carried out on the details view. But obviously, you need some information from the previous view. And that means that you have to isolate the items that you're going to transfer over. And that could be quite um, um, intensive if you're transferring a lot of data. So that was something I kept asking myself as well. Um, the following thing was, out of the final motion, what is the root view for your scene? So what is the container that, that has all of its items? And that has a very interesting um, restriction on how you actually build that layout as a developer. Because if you're animating things, um, you need to, they need to be inside a container. So sometimes you take the liberty of putting different containers and organizing things differently. But once you put a scene in, in, in there, you know, kind of you have to be very uh, specific about how you build the view. So that was a very interesting question that came out of that. Um, a following question is obviously how complicated you want it to be. And well, it needs to be. So that basically answer creates a further question on how you're going to implement it. And you have two options for implementing it. You can either do the changes programmatically, and that's if um, the motion is actually quite simple, like hiding or showing an item or changing its size. 
Um, but if there's lots of elements within the screen that are animating, you might want to consider creating a scene. And in development terms, a scene, as far as Android is concerned, is basically the creation of two different layouts. Your first scene is a layout of what all of your elements need to be for the beginning of the animation. And then the final uh, layout is your final scene where the, the elements will be when the animation is finished. That means that the Android system can look at these two layouts, calculate the differences, and then basically build the motion for you. Um, this is very, very important when you have things that are moving positions within the screen and also the path that it takes. So it saves you a lot of, of calculations and, and all of the complexity kind of is abstracted onto the operation system, which gives uh, helps you a lot. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So these are the two um, uh, the two simple animations I've seen simple motions I've created um, to answer these questions, and you see here on the left hand side you've got a shared element animation that I was uh, talking about earlier, where you have a list of movies which moves over to uh, the detail screen. So that's a shared element uh, motion which provided a lot of uh, learnings when that was implemented. So it's really great. And on the right hand side, I wanted to implement something that was um, constrained to a single activity. So it was just the sliding up of the details when you touch the chevron rotating it, etc. So um, this kind of gave me a, a better understanding of when I'm having a conversation with a designer, what specifically I need to know. So it was very interesting um, to come up with these things and figuring out what is actually really important. And one of the things I found myself playing, playing with a lot was um, basically just the, the, the duration of the whole animation, which kind of make different things stand out. And it was, was quite interesting. So I won't go into detail about what specific variables we need, because that's what Anders will be talking to you in a minute. Um, but it was very a very um, a very good learning process to do this. So I'll hand over to you, Anders. But before that, next slide gives you a view of the um, complete animation that I've created to give you an idea of the things I've tried out. Perfect. Thanks. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk through an example of how I typically break down motion into its component parts, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail on some of those. Um, so you'll always have a trigger that kind of dictates why or when the motion should occur. So that might be a trigger like um, when you tap on something, or, or it might be just when, when the scene loads. Um, and this trigger will then send in motion some sort of object. And of course, we need to define the property that we're animating for example, the scale or the opacity, um, as well as the duration of that animation, uh, uh, along with any delay that it might have before it starts. Um, so this is kind of the basic basic breakdown of motion, um, but to add the right kind of personality and flow to it, you're probably also going to need to specify the easing or the interpolator. Um, and it doesn't really have to be more complicated than that. So depending on the complexity of your motion, I, how many objects you're transforming, you can kind of choose the process of handing over that gets you to where you need to be the quickest, which is very similar to the mindset of prototyping. So if I'm, for example, just defining uh, the way a badge gets introduced, I'm most likely just do a style sheet. But if it's a more complex custom screen transition with like multiple objects moving at different rates, our objects are masked or replaced mid-transition, then I'll definitely have to do a full motion spec. So going back to the building blocks, I'm not really going to talk about the object trigger response bit because that's kind of all about building your prototype and that's that's a very different talk um but looking at timing as a whole so duration and delay um i think that kind of has to be the, the biggest source of bad motion when you're starting out it's definitely why i go wrong all the time myself um when i was new to prototyping and it's the thing i see other people get wrong the most as well i think it's just because you're focusing on, on such a small thing, you're looking at just this animation and you're, you're so zoned in on it, you kind of forget the bigger picture and you, it, it's so easy to just overplay it. Um, but the motion should never really be slow enough that it starts to draw attention to itself because it's it's not about just that one contained animation. It's, it's all about the, the bigger experience. Um, and I'm wondering if this is somehow connected to the fact that 
most design tools kind of operate with seconds as the unit, whereas you would typically build it in milliseconds. So this would be the, the default for Android. Um, and in the world of micro interactions, the difference between 100 and 150 milliseconds actually makes a difference. Um, but if we look at, for example, Protopy, um, kind of default timing input field, you can kind of bracket up by by 100 milliseconds at a time. And it's I think it's a really small subconscious detail that just gets in the way of, of a more seamless collaboration between design and dev. Like that one of us has to manually convert the units just seems a bit unnecessary to me. Um, and it's also something as a designer, I would never really think to put 0 0.15 into this field. Um, timing can be quite tricky to review as well when you working on, on it and kind of reviewing it on the device, um, especially if it's a more complex one with like staggered elements and different easing curves. So it's, it's always really useful, I think, to ask your engineer to render the animation at a slower rate, just to make sure that there's no glitches or unwanted effects happening. On a side note, I would say this is a really good exercise I'd recommend. Um, so you can set your device to render animations on a, on a global scale to say 25 or 10% of the speed, and then you can just go through your app and see everything very much in detail. Because um, so you'd be guaranteed to kind of find new things that you never noticed at the normal playback speed. So for example, the, the kind of awkward way some items might get loaded in, or just which transitions get really annoying after a while when you've seen them the third and the fourth time. Um, and like, as you can see here, on, on Android, you can do that uh, in the developer options and system settings. I think it's a really nice um, thing to kind of just get a better understanding of how certain animations are, are built. So you can do that within your own app, but you can also do that, go into other apps, um, be it native or kind of custom ones, and you can you can see how how the different animations that you like or dislike are, are built. Um, next, looking at interpolators. Um, I think this is what I personally found the most difficult to communicate um, because it doesn't necessarily match one to one. So, for example, the ease in default is not an, an Android interpolator, but at the same time, I can't really work with the Android interpolators within Protopy. So, it's just kind of speaking two different languages and, and not really knowing how to translate it. Um, so, I kind of went down this rabbit hole of, of wanting to understand better how interpolators work beyond just me kind of playing around with the with the curve inside the software and kind of tweaking it until it feels about right. So I started kind of trying to create my own definition of what interpolators are, which I came down to being an abstraction of the mathematics behind how the animation is created. So if we look at that, kind of break it down and look at it in detail, the animation side of it, so You'll always have a design for a starting point, which will then transform in some way or another towards an end point. And that start and end kind of represents each end of your vertical axis on this graph. And the abstraction of that kind of comes in because the two states and anything happening in between are just represented as a value between zero and one. It doesn't, it doesn't matter which value or by how much you're changing it, it's just going to give it a a number from zero to one. And the same with the with the timing being the horizontal axis. It could be 100 milliseconds or it could be a minute. It doesn't matter. All it's going to give you is a number from zero to one. Um, so these values are then used to create the frames of your animation from start to end. And the most basic animation kind of transforms your object at a constant rate based on the time value. So this would be your linear animation. But the mathematics kind of makes it really interesting because it allows you to displace these values to create animations where the transformation doesn't follow the time value. So for example, the transformation might happen over a disproportionate amount of time to create an ease in. And here we just see a visual example of that happening. So we have a transformation mapped exactly to the curve. So most of the time, because of what I mentioned with interpolators not necessarily matching between my design software and the way the engineer will build it, I will usually define that manually. So I might use the, the defaults as a starting point to kind of play around to 
to get somewhere close to where I want to be, but then I'll translate that preset into the exact value. For example, using easings.net, which is just a, an overview of the open source library, the same one that Protopy is using. So I can click into one of these and I can get the exact Bezier value for that easing. And then I can send that over to Louis and he will kind of set it up as a custom interpolator. She just create an array based on those points and then you have it working. Um, but of course this could get pretty tedious quite quickly because it takes a bit of extra effort every time to remap the values. So as you start to kind of um, define your own motion language, we can actually define and reuse our own branded interpolators, which I think is quite cool, rather than writing them every single time. So for example, I might define a certain curve and define that as the new channel four ease in. So in the same way that you use um, or define global styles for text and colors in a, in a global style sheet and reuse them, you can, you can do the same thing with your motion and build it with global styles. Um, moving into the last section, um, how Protopy specifically kind of helps us. So I think the main benefit that I've found using Protopy is just how it inherently makes you build more logical prototypes. So you build things with conditional logic and you, you base your transformations on real parameters. Uh, it's not just a series of magic moves that has to be played in a certain order, which certain other prototyping tools tend to rely on. I'm not going to mention any names, um, but those are not the, the principles that Judy likes to work with. Um, so because I'm able to put my, um, so because of this kind of uh, more logical way of building things, I'm able to put my prototypes in front of stakeholders uh, and in front of the developers and even in front of users, because you don't need to know how to, how to use it before you see it. So really simple things like saving the, the state of a toggle so that it doesn't matter which one you turn on or off, or even if you navigate back to the previous screen and, and back again, it's still smart enough to, to always rem remember the state that you left it in. Um, one idea that I've started using quite often is layering on top of my pies. So here I'm just picking up a component from that I built earlier. It's just a pretty simple drawer navigation. So I've got two options within it, um, which means that I can put that on top of my pre-built prototype. So our app doesn't actually use a drawer navigation. It has a bottom navigation bar. So the idea here is that I'm, I'm adding extra functionality on top of my, my prototype so that when I send this, for example, to a stakeholder, I can show them two variations of the same prototype, which means that they can they can kind of re review them side by side without having to, to kind of manage two different prototypes in, in two different links. And then you forget which is which and you have to jump in between them and it gets really confusing. But also for me as a designer, that means I can just work on one single prototype and any changes that I make are reflected in both of those straight away, which I think is quite, quite neat. Um, and then later on in the process, when I'm working with my engineer to implement the prototype, I can take this idea even further. So again, I, I've, I've got a finished prototype which I've set up with this menu component. So this is an example of just a hero carousel. So I've got a couple of items set up to the side here. And it's a pretty simple chain reaction that's going to reduce the opacity of my first item on scroll, and it's going to increase the opacity of the second item on scroll. So the, kind of the one you're, you're bringing in kind of fades in and just subtly brings your attention to the next item. So we, we're all kind of happy with the design. It's all approved. We're now getting ready to deliver and build this. So my thinking here is that because proto I've, I've already set up the prototype to kind of be based on the real variables and Protopy already holds all of the, the values I need. So what I did here is I just set up four variables to track those things that I want to I want to communicate and then I just turn on this debugging feature, which means that the, the data actually shows up within, within the view. And then going back, I can, I can add in my components so that when I send this to the engineer, I'll get this little onboarding message to say that there's two variants. So you can see the prototype as it's meant to be seen by the user and just see, get the general feel of it. But then you can also turn on these annotations and as it interacts with them, it will get a, kind of a live feed of, of the values changing. So you'll understand exactly 
my thinking as a designer, how did I kind of define the, the interaction? And you can then start to think, how is that going to map to the to the real build? Um, so I think this is a really cool um, idea and a really cool feature of Protopy. Um, the only thing I didn't like is that it's just going to be a bit limiting because you, by using this debug feature, you kind of fill the screen with annotations. It, it worked fine for this one example. Looking more kind of to the future, if I had a, something a bit more complex like this one, this is just a proof of concept. So we've got a, a scroll view, um, which has some interactions happening. So we have this profile picture in the top that's going to scale down. It's going to move to the side. The height of that nav bar is going to reduce. And we're going to introduce some opacity to it as well, which is all happening based on the scroll position. So it's definitely a more complex one, um, which means I can't necessarily just fill the screen with those annotations. So what I'm doing here is I'm just grouping the prototype with itself. Um, and then I'm actually going to change the device type. So I'm going to say this is now a desktop prototype, um, which gives me some of that extra room that I kind of need. Um, so I can maybe start to add my annotations around it. Um, so I'm just indenting it a little bit um, and kind of making sure it's still set to the, to the correct size. Um, and then just going to change the background colors I make. So I make sure it's, it's actually visible and it, it's a, there's a separation between the, the prototype itself and then clip it. And what I did earlier is I just set up like a, a, a super basic text list. So the, you can see the prototype is still working. So it's kind of now like an iframe within a, within a web page. Um, so what I did earlier, I just set up a list of all the variables I want to track. Um, I just left them blank for now because what I'm doing here as well is um, I'm just going to, I've got the variables tracking everything I need, but then I'm going to set up a text formula. So instead of just me manually writing out the, the values, I'm going to do the same idea as before and create a formula that says, I know for this example, I'm going to, I'm going to look at the, the list scroll position and I want to track that within my view. And just going to round that off as well so I get a nice even number without any decimal points. And that means that it's going to print the value that I chose to track. So when I interact with my prototype now, I've got all the, the values off to the side showing exactly what's happening. So I've got an interactive motion spec, which is really, really cool. Um, of course, it's just a, a proof of concept for now, but hoping to kind of try this on a feature next time we're working on a piece of motion. And that's it. So thank you very much for listening. And back over to you, Darren. Cool. Thanks, guys. That was um, that was really interesting, especially um, getting towards the end and thinking about how ProPy can you can use like the, the, the power within within the tool to actually communicate the motion. Um, I just had a couple of questions, actually. Yeah. Um, so Louise, you was talking about within Android, you've got this concept of the starting state and then this ending state and you set those kind of things and then the animation kind of happens mm -hmm. in between um after you've done that can you still tweak the animation that that generates manually on top of kind of what you get as the default yes you can definitely um customize pretty much the entire animation and you can use the variables provided by the designer to do so you can um Customize interpolator, duration, delays, all of that. The, the the scene is more about coping for, for example, different screen sizes, positioning, and all the stuff, which is obviously it's going to be different on every screen. So it's more about that side of things, which we don't really care about. We just wanted to, you know, show up at this point and all the the exact position doesn't matter. We just care about the interpolators, the the the, the motion, all that stuff is completely customizable. Yeah. Cool. I guess the question to you, at, well, I guess you both, but to you, Anderson, this kind of idea of this starting and end scene, do you see any value in giving those values over as a starting point? Like it was almost like you mentioned another tool and, and probably a bunch of tools kind of work on that same premise that you have a starting state and ending state and it works the animations in between. But would there be value of statically providing those or do you think that's not not really that useful? Um, Based on the fact that Android is using that same kind of like starting and ending as a as a kind of start starting point. 
if you're talking about within prototyping, I think it's um, I think it's it's a quite a nice idea that I I like. It. I think it's a really easy way to get to some to to somewhere really quickly. It might not be the perfect solution straight out of the box, but it, it's certainly much quicker than setting everything up manually. So I think it's a the, there might still be a, a place for that kind of magic move because it allows you to create just that very rough prototype super super quickly. Just a lot of the time, what you want, you don't necessarily want to spend ages setting up something and then realizing it's not going to work. Um, so, yeah, for me, that's that's something that would be useful. Cool. Um, one final question. Um, you're talking about the interpolators not matching between Protopy and Android, and you're kind of going down this route of Cubic Bezier, which obviously you can do with in, inside of Protopy. You can you can kind of put put Cubic Bezier's in. Yeah. Um, is there a um, is there a way of finding out? You know, you said you've got these kind of like default Android interpolators. Is there a way of finding out what would they map to a cubic base? Could you basically take the the Android interpolators and then use them inside a prototype? So it's always kind of like the other way around, or is that is there not like any any facility to kind of see what's inside of those default Android interpolators? I guess that's a very half a question for Louise as well. As far as like went out of the box yeah. and interpolates, can you actually dig into it and see what's actually what values it's using under the hood? So in terms of Android, sorry, um, you can uh, drill into the actual how the code is written. So when you open the IDE that you work that I work with to program Android apps, you can drill into all the interpolators and see how that's being built. So I can then pass that over to Anders if if it's necessary. That'd be quite cool. I think it would be really nice to just kind of map that and have it as a as a little library, yeah, to kind of test out the basic ones because a lot of the time you just want a, a super simple ease in or ease out, mm -hmm. uh, and then it doesn't really matter if it's if one of the variables is is zero point two two or zero point two three. But I I don't really care to be to get that granular. So if if one of the defaults are working and get me to kind of the, the same kind of end result, that would be really nice. Yeah, I think you were saying that there's, um, just going through all those interpolators, and I've done that a little bit myself, is that sometimes it's really hard to notice, to see a noticeable difference between one or another. Yeah. And it's almost the more you try, the more similar they seem to become. <laughs> and then you kind of end up back at the first one and as being like good enough to communicate, you know, for the human eye is not going to tell a difference between a protopy interpolator ease out and probably an android version which may 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 or may not have slightly different values but yeah it's kind of interesting it's kind of i was kind of thinking that it'd be might quite interesting to be able to save um like presets inside a protopy of of cubic bezier's that you may create so it's like it's almost like the reverse of what you guys are doing mm -hmm. with louise creating a custom android version mm -hmm. of something so that might be quite interesting yeah, I think it's something a lot of other people would appreciate as well. Because I think the kind of the maturity of motion as a motion design as a, its own kind of thing it's just getting bigger and bigger. And you see a lot of brands kind of starting to to consider motion as part of their style guide. So you you map your topography and your colors, but you also map your motion, and you have a branded kind of motion language. Um, so like with the idea of having a branded channel four ease in, I could definitely be like something I, I set up my own library and I'm just going to work with those. Maybe something for the pro buy guys to think of when they're, as we know, they're working on libraries at the moment. Maybe mm. there's a motion yeah. library aspect to that shared library that they, they might be able to build in something yeah. we can probably um, suggest to them. Yeah. That's cool. One. That's, that's great. Um, any, any final comments before we wrap up? Nope. No, okay. Well, I'd like to extend my thanks both to Anders and Louise for um, redoing this um, this this talk, which unfortunately um, we didn't we didn't record in in, in the live um, Protopie London online session. Um, but we're definitely going to be um, recording the the future events. So again, thanks very much for your time, guys, and um, have a great day. Thank cool. you. Cheers.